Good morning. Please open your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Curtis stole all my jokes. <laughs> I got nothing left. Actually, Darren was here earlier this morning. He just stopped by to say hi. He did. And then he had to go to his church. Ah, he's right. Ah. I miss Darren. Uh, but he misses me more. All right. <laughs> We're in a new series called Open. I want to thank Pastor Kevin for inviting me back. It's uh, really good to be back. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, last time, he talked about open to be healthy. And uh, today, we're talking about open to be owned. But before we do that, I want to share a joy, a momentous occasion in our family's life. One of the greatest joys in a parent's life is to lead their kids to the Lord which I was able to do when my sons were nine and seven, respectively. But I only got to baptize them this last summer, about a week before uh, school started. So I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, Timothy on the left, Nicholas on the right. Timothy's with us this morning. He's a freshman at Grace now. And then Nicholas is a freshman at the high school, but he's on a church retreat today. So I just wanted to share that joy uh, with you. Last Sunday, we learned that open hearts lead to open hands. And uh, we come to the book of Chronicles, uh, which is a very uh, important book. Those of you who love history, Chronicles is a book of history. Uh, the chronicler actually just means historian. So Chronicles is a history book. And whoever is the historian, in this case, is writing about the history of Israel and focuses on David. David, King David, and the, the hope of the temple. Uh, see, this historian is in a way very biased historian. He, he wants to show David in a very positive light. He doesn't talk about David's sin with Bathsheba. Uh, he doesn't mention any of the uh, censuses that uh, David does and God is angry with him because that's not the point of this book. The point of this book is to show that David wanted to build a temple to the Lord. And God says to David, David, good thought. But because you're a man of war, because there's, there's blood on your hands, you will not build that temple for me. But your son Solomon will build that temple for me. And what we see here at the end of uh, the book, basically these are David's last days. And he, he wants to get involved into the building project. And as you know, any building project requires funds and requires resources. And, and we see that David leads by example. And that's the first lesson we learn. First Chronicles chapter 29 is that godly leaders lead by example. Look with me, please, in chapter 29 of First Chronicles, starting in verse 1. And David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen is young and inexperienced, and the work is great, for the palace will not be for men, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God, so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of onyx and stones for setting antimony, colored stones, and all sorts of precious stones and marble. Moreover, in addition to all this I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver, and because of my devotion to the house of my God, I will give it to the house of my God. 3,000 talents of gold and gold of Ophir and 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the house and for all the work to be done by craftsmen, gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver. So we see David says, look, we have a great project to do, now you guys give, right? No, no, no. Godly leaders always lead by example. Hey, we, we need this, and I am the first one to give so much. That's what David does. Not only does he do that, but he challenges others to be generous as well. First, David leads by example, but then he says, you, those of you who are leaders especially, you need 
to consecrate yourselves to the Lord. Who then, this is a question, who then will offer willingly consecrating himself to the Lord? Did you catch that? He says, who then will offer willingly, but then he ties in giving with consecration. Consecration comes from the ex experience of the idea of being holy to the Lord. Giving, in other words, is an act of worship. Giving is an act of worship. We just were celebrating the 500 years of the Reformation, right? Do you know what one thing that came out of the Reformation, one very important thing, was the priesthood of all believers. Remember that? In other words, that we are all priests bringing sacrifices. That's everything that we do in life. Preaching, teaching, singing, giving, whatever it is, it's an act, an act of worship to the Lord. And that's what David wants people to understand. Sure, David leads by example, then he challenges everybody else. Notice to consecrate themselves, to set, to set apart, to be set apart for the Lord. Who then will offer willingly, not begrudgingly, not I'm going to twist your arm, but willingly to consecrate and then consecrating himself to the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, you cannot say, I'm consecrating myself to the Lord but I do what I want with my possessions. Open to be owned is about being owned by God first. Again, we learned last week, open hearts lead to open hands. If we indeed worship God with everything that we do, giving should be an act of worship. And in this case, in this case, the faithful respond by being generous uh, we have all these numbers here. They gave for the service of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18 talents bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. It, when you do the math, in today's money, that would come to about $30 million. Would you say that was a successful campaign? <laughs> I would say so. But notice, please, what happens. First, David leads by example. Then he challenges the people not just to be generous, but to be consecrating themselves to the Lord, to be holy to the Lord. You've got to give yourself to God first, and then everything else that you do will follow, including what you do with your money. But if you live with the idea, hey, what, what is mine is mine, and that is God's, then your giving will be off. I've heard people like that. And that's why I could never understand how come we can pay more for cable TV than for what we give to church. Think about that for a second. Is it, is it right in your mind? I'm not, I don't know how much you make, I don't know how much you give, but ask yourself in your mind, is it okay for you to give more to cable TV or cell phone service than what you give to church? Just ask yourself that question. Ask it that way. But the faithful in this case respond by being generous. And they give because they first consecrated themselves to the Lord. And we see that generosity gives way to joy. Look at the end result. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly. For with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced greatly. Open hearts lead to open hands. Pastor Kevin taught us last week. One scholar puts it like this. People are closest to God likeness in self-giving. And the nearer they approach God likeness, the more genuinely, genuinely and rightly they become capable of rejoicing. I like that. People are closest to God likeness in self-giving. God gave of himself. He gave his only son. Then when we get closer to him, we will do the same in our self-giving. And when that happens, not only do the leaders rejoice, but all the people rejoice. Do you think there will be joy next Sunday if Kevin will get up here and say, we have met the challenge? Do you think he will rejoice? You will. But in order for you to rejoice, you need to step up and give yourself to God and be generous because what you have is really 
what God allows you to have. Now, God, God, godly leaders praise God. Notice, please, the, the, the result not only produces joy in David's heart, but then now he addresses the Lord. He's done addressing the people. Now he's addressing the Lord, starting in verse 10. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, and Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and all in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. And then verse 12. Again, David understands that everything that we have is from God. He says, Both riches and honor come from you. And you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. My dear brothers and sisters, if we have anything, any possessions that we have is because God allows us to have those possessions. If we can make money, it's because God gives us strength so we can get up and go to work and make those money. Everything we should, we should understand that everything is because of God's love, mercy, and grace for us. And that's why godly leaders will always praise God, and godly leaders will always give credit where credit is due. And that's why David not only praises the Lord, but he also thanks the Lord. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. We are approaching Thanksgiving. Are there things we can be thankful for? There are, right? There are many things we can be thankful for. And when we thank God, that kind of becomes very contagious. When you, isn't, isn't, isn't it better to, to, to have friends and uh, people that are very encouraging and thankful? It's contagious, isn't it? Where's Curtis? Is that, is that rain? Is that a storm? Okay, I'm glad we're inside then. We thank God for the rain. Amen. Amen. Godly leaders not only thank God, but godly leaders recognize God's provision. Again, verse 14. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able thus to offer wingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given to you, David, again, recognizes the source of his blessing. All things come from you. So let's get, let's get down to the bottom line. I know some of you are business people. Okay, Tiberius, what's the bottom line? How much should I give? That's the question. How much should I give? Well, in order to answer that question, I think we already answered it, but I'm gonna, we're going to go again to we're going to cross the bridge into the New Testament. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 12. I want us to cross the bridge into the New Testament and see what Jesus has to say about giving. Because people always ask me, Tiberius, how much should I give? Is, is 10% still the minimum requirement? Or should I think about more? I think we have an answer in Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12, first of all, we see Jesus at the temple, starting in verse 38. Jesus is at the temple teaching, and the first thing he does, he condemns the predators. Look in verses 38 and on. Jesus, as he's teaching at the temple, says, be aware of the scribes, who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich, many rich people put in large sums. See, there was a place at the temple where you could give your donations. They did not pass the plate around there because people would come different times of the day to the temple. They would come from different places. There was not one time to take the offering. So they would have certain places around the, the temple where they could come and put their money in. These were large treasure chests and 
uh, there were large treasure chests and there were some, some things that looked like trumpets, brass trumpets where you dropped your coins in. So imagine that the more money you had, the louder the sound when you dropped the money. That's why I love online giving because nobody knows how much you give and nobody hears the how much you put in. Right? I, I, I like that. See, oh, oh, this is brilliant. On the back of the bulletin, it says four ways to give. Back in Jesus' time, there was only one way to give. You guys have four ways to give. In person, online, through text, and automa automated. Well, oh, whatever that word is, I don't know. <laughs> Something auto. It must, I think, by car. I think that's what it means. <laughs> it's not wrong to be rich, my dear brothers and sisters. But when you give, and you give so people can hear how much you give, then that's wrong. Jesus condemns the predators here. See, many rich people put in large sums, but Jesus is not commanding the rich people here. Verse 41 says, And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in the sums. And then in verse 42, we see that Jesus commands the generous. But look who the generous are. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So imagine the scene. All these guys would, would come with their big donations and they would make a fuss about how much you would fall in. And Jesus doesn't commend them. Jesus commands the poor widow who put in two copper coins. They maybe didn't even make a sound. Jesus commands the widow. The widow makes it into biblical history, not because of how big her check was, but because her commitment was total. She gave everything. And that's the lesson. The, the lesson in giving is for us to give ourselves to God totally. And then the answer how much to give will come very easily. But we try to nickel and dime God because we don't understand this concept of commitment. Jesus commands the widow and says, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. In God's economy, it doesn't matter the dollar amount but how much you are given in relation to how much you have. How much God has given to you. That's why there's wisdom in you not knowing how much I give online and me not knowing how much you give online or in person or by car, however you want to give it. <laughs> it, it. It really doesn't matter. It's good for us not to know because some of us might be proud. Some of us might not be. But the widow demonstrated trust. She trusted that God can take care of her even, as, even if she gave all that she had. I think I told you the story before about the, the pig and the chicken. Remember, they wanted to go on business together. They said, let's open a business. Uh, we're going to open a breakfast business. And we will serve ham and eggs. <laughs> and the chicken was ready to go into this. The pig said, Yeah, but if we do this, what you give is an offering. What I give is sacrifice. 
See, a lot of us are very good about businesses when, every, when someone else sacrifices, not when I sacrifice. We're okay with offerings. Oh, yeah. I, we can give, you know, the nickels and the dimes. But what about sacrificial giving? The only time in Scripture where God says, put me to the test, is in Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, God says, bring the full tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down your blessing until there is no more need. The concept of 10%, my dear brothers and sisters, was not devised by a group of pastors. The concept of the 10% was not devised by Moses and his contemporaries. This is the only place in the whole Bible where God says, test me. The only place. The principle, again, is not that our money is ours, but that God allows us to have it. Because he says, if you don't give it, then you rob the Lord. Did you catch that? The concept there was God gave you 100%, and if you keep what it said, well, everything for you instead of giving it to God, you are a thief. Everything that we have, my dear brothers and sisters, should be God's. If you want to know how committed you are to God, check your checkbook. Look at what you spend the money on this last month, and you will answer the question how much you are God's. How much you want to serve God? Kent Hughes writes, there is a disease which is particularly virulent in our century. It is called cirrhosis of the giver. <laughs> it was actually discovered about 34 AD and it ran a terminal course in a couple named Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. It is an acute condition which renders the patient's sand immobile when it attempts to move from the billfold to the offering plate. The remedy is to remove the afflicted from the house of God. Since it is clinically observable that this condition disappears in alternate environments, such as golf courses, clubs, or restaurants. Actually, the disease is really not a motor problem. It is a heart problem. But the best remedy is to fall in love with God and with all your heart. For where your heart is, there will also your treasure be. There are three levels of giving. My good friend Calvin Miller, who's now with the Lord, said there are three levels of giving. The fame level, the game level, and the shame level. He writes this. At the fame level, a strange bout with pride begins. It is easy at the level to be proud and ostentatious. This was the level at which the Pharisees gave and made a great show of their devotion. When they gave, they held the coins high and dropped them with a brazen ring in the temple coffers. At the game level, the giver tries to figure out what is the most blessing he can buy with the least down payment. Such givers try to figure out how to give a little bit in such flamboyant ways that they purchase a generous reputation with their well-publicized pittances. Game givers try to figure out what would be reasonable in comparison to what others are giving. They compare their offerings with the average and then they give just a little more. That's the game level. The last level, the shame level, is the level of those who can never give enough. These givers always look at the price Jesus paid at Calvary even when they give all, they wish it were more. They even feel a little ashamed. It is so little. Someone said, when I write a check to the IRS, the IRS doesn't care if I give willingly or grudgingly. I don't know about you, but I write that grudgingly. <laughs> I do. But when it comes to God's work, that shouldn't be. 
First Corinthians 13, 3 says, If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. But if I give a penny with a widow's heart, it is gain to me and to God. God, my dear brothers and sisters, is blessing us. And all that we have is from him and is his. The question is, what level are we at when we give? And how sacrificially do we give? I read about two Christians who were visiting China. They were both very wealthy. One was a lawyer and the other one was a merchant. And they visited, uh, and they were visiting uh, someone, not, sorry, not in China, in Korea. And they were, uh, they were in Korea and they were traveling and looking at uh, different things in the countryside. And, uh, as they were traveling, they saw an unusual sight. It was um, a boy pulling a plow while an old man held his hands, the handles, and uh, well, he thought it was unusual that instead of a, an ox or a, or a horse, it was a boy pulling the plow. The lawyer was amused, so he took a picture. Commenting to that, the guide, he said, that is an unusual sight. I suppose they are very poor. And the pastor said, yes, they are very poor. That is the family of Chi Nui. When the church was built, was being built in this area, they were excited to give something to help it along, but they had no money, so they sold their only ox and gave the money to the church. This spring, they are taking turns pulling the plow themselves. The guide said, the lawyer said, that must have been a real sacrifice. The guide said, they did not call it that. When they reached home, the lawyer took the picture to the pastor. As he sat down in the pastor's study, he said forcefully, I want to double my pledge to the church, and please give me some plow work to do. I have never known what sacrifice for the church meant. A converted Korean taught me, I am ashamed to say I have never yet given anything to my church that cost me anything. My dear brothers and sisters, before you give, please understand God is interested in you. God is interested that you totally commit yourself to him and then give at whatever level you want. For application this morning, I just have two. First, surrender your all to God, and then be a cheerful giver. When, when Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 9, he makes it very clear about this concept, this principle, that first you need to give yourself to God before you give anything. In 2 Corinthians 9, uh, verse Chapter 8, please, uh, First chapter 8, verses 3 to 5. Paul is commanding the church in Macedonia and says, For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And then by the will of God to us. So it's not about how much you give. How much are you surrendered to God? Second of all, be a cheerful giver. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul writes, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he had made up in his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. <coughs> My dear brothers and sisters, the, the, sermon of the, the, the title of the sermon is Open to be Owned, because the idea is to be owned by God. Are you totally committed to God? Is, does he own you? Or do you always think about what do I owe?
or who, what do I own? Open hearts lead to open hands, right? But fully surrendered lives will lead to fully surrendered lives forever. My prayer for you is that you will say, like Francis Havergal, who said, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thy, thou shalt choose. Are you ready to do that? I'm not asking you to come down the aisle to make and say how much you give. I want you to do that in your own heart. But before you give, or you decide what you're going to give, give yourself to the Lord. If there are still areas in your life that you think, hey, I'm the boss of that, then you have a heart problem and you need to care, take care of that. And then decide to be a cheerful giver, giving not under compulsion, but because you want to. So let's stand together and sing this song called Take My Life and Let It Be. And um, in one of the verses, we will sing that, even that, take my silver and my gold. But before we do that, it says, take my life and let it be. So let's sing this together as, a, as an answer to God's word today. Father, we thank you for godly leaders who have led in the past. And thank you for godly followers who uh, answered the call to be generous, to consecrate themselves to the Lord. I pray that you will forgive us for the many times when we thought that what we have is ours and only 10% or more was yours. Help us understand that everything that we have is from you. Help us to, to, to receive it with gratitude and help us to then look and see how can we help those who are in need. I pray that Black Hawk will continue to be a, a light in this dark world and you'll use them through their many ministries that they have through the school and the church and the outreach, whatever they do, may they be consecrated to you in such a way that many people will come to the saving knowledge of Christ as the result of their ministry. And I do pray for this endeavor this week 
that you will touch the hearts of those who need to step up and surrender themselves to you, along with their giving, along with their singing, along with their serving, whatever it is. May we give ourselves first to you, and may you use us for your glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen.